Welcome to the REBT Advocates with Dr. Michael R. Edelstein and Tommy Bateman. Today we compare Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy, or REBT, to Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT. Let's get started. Okay, so Michael, we're talking about an article you wrote for Psychology Today back in March of 2017 in which you compared REBT to CBT. You make the case that while both treatments have a solid empirical foundation, REBT is more comprehensive. Let's elaborate on that. Uh, one thing that both REBT and CBT share is a basic assumption that our emotions don't come from situations themselves. If you insult me and I feel hurt, it wasn't you insulting me that caused me to feel hurt, but it was what I was telling myself. The ideas in, the, in my head caused my emotions, and uh, for both REBT and CBT, that's a very, very powerful concept because if it's your thinking that's causing your disturbed emotions, then you can change your thinking. So I would say uh, in explaining the two approaches, that's uh, the commonality and that tells you a lot about what they deal with. Did you want to add to that, Tommy? Just to repeat what you said, CBT is a robust and evidence-based therapy. Managed care organizations love it as it has measurable, solution-focused outcomes and clear interventions. Fortunately for REBT, it has all that CBT has, plus a deeper, more developed philosophy. In fact, that's the first difference in your article, that REBT is more philosophic in addition to empirical. What does that mean? So what that means is when we look at a person's thinking, we not only ask what is the evidence for it, but we ask, can it possibly be true at all given the human condition and the reality of the world? So as a specific example, suppose uh, someone has a compulsive drinking problem and um, their goal is not to drink it at all. And one night they think, well, I'll just have one drink and then I'll stop. So uh, CBT would identify that. You were thinking, I'll just have one drink and then I'll stop. Is it true? Uh, is there evidence for it? And then you and the therapist might come up with, well, there's not evidence for it in the sense I've told myself 99 times before I'll have one drink and I'll stop and, I'll never, and I haven't stopped. Or uh, if I can stop after one drink, then I can certainly stop before one drink. Or, or this will sabotage my goal to abstain, not to drink at all. So all this makes a lot of sense, and REBT does use a strategy. But in addition, REBT looks at where does, why are you making these rationalizations in the first place? And often the answer is because underlying the rationalizations you have a deep demand, a must or a should. That's your philosophy, a philosophy of demanding and commanding. And that normally takes the form of because I have this craving and I prefer to have a drink, therefore I absolutely must. I have to. My life will be awful and I couldn't stand it if I didn't satisfy my craving. And then in order to uh, excuse that and rationalize that, you tell yourself, well, I'll just have one drink and I'll stop. So that's what you look at. It's sort of like the Aesop's fable of the fox and the grapes. The fox is jumping, is hungry and jumping for the grapes and uh, can't reach the grapes. And the fox says to himself, oh, I didn't want those grapes at all. They're probably sour grapes. So rather than admitting that he wasn't uh, able to jump high enough, probably because he was thinking, I should be able to, and I'm a bad fox because I didn't, he picked up an excuse. So it's the same uh, with this example with a person and their addiction. So we help people look at the reality of the situation. Is it likely you'll only have one drink? And what's the demand there? What's the demand underlying the uh, belief that and the excuse? that gives rise to it, and let's uproot that. And then if you uproot that, that I must satisfy my craving, otherwise I'll be miserable forever, and you get rid of that kind of thinking, you see you can accept cravings, you can accept discomforts, then that would not only help you in this specific situation, but in other situations where you deal with cravings or other 
physical discomfort. That highlights one of the reasons I transitioned from a primarily CBT therapist to an REBT one, because that addition of the philosophy that is on its face true. One of my favorite things about REBT is that even if one takes away the clear empirical backing for REBT, as if the clinical studies were never done in the first place, we would still be left with a solid philosophical foundation that goes back 2,000 years to folks like Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus. Yes, that's very good. And uh, there's a lot to be said about that. Maybe we can have one podcast just on that, that, that philosophic basis. Let's move on to another difference between REBT and CBT. And uh, another one is that REBT is one of the, is the only therapy that I know of that highlights secondary disturbance, getting upset about being upset. So getting anxious about being anxious or depressed about being depressed or anxious about being depressed. So first you're, you have a disturbance, psychological, emotional, or behavioral, and then you disturb yourself about that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I haven't seen any writings in the CBT literature that focuses on that. Once in a while they mention it in passing, but REBT spends a lot of time on that and helps people overcome that. And once they overcome their secondary disturbance, that makes it a lot easier to get at the primary disturbance, or it might eliminate the primary disturbance entirely, since often the secondary disturbance magnifies any primary disturbance or any imagined primary disturbance, and then there's, uh, then when it doesn't, then the primary disturbance disappears. It holds a person back from addressing the solutions for the original problem because they are distracted by the thought, I must not be worried, that would be a terrible thing, which is putting in an unrealistic and irrational demand for perfection on themselves. Right, exactly. And then in terms of the actual sentences that people tell themselves, first they start with, let's suppose they're going to give a uh, talk to a large audience and they tell themselves, I must not be anxious about the talk. And uh, not I must not be anxious, but I must not be disapproved of or thought poorly of when I give the talk. Mm -hmm. That leads to primary anxiety because it's uh, anxiety about a specific situation out there. And then you notice you're going to be anxious or you remind yourself you might be anxious at the talk. And then you have a second must. I must not get anxious at the talk. So it's a must about a must. And the solution normally is to start with the secondary and ask yourself, what is the evidence that because I strongly prefer not to be anxious, I have a, a passionate desire to do well and get approval in this uh, talk, and I'm anxious about that, what is the evidence I absolutely must not get anxious? And the answer normally is, since I'm an imperfect human who was evolved, born, and raised to get anxious, as all humans are, then there's no reason why I must not get anxious, even though I prefer not to. And then, Tommy, as you were saying, then the more you accept that, the more, the less anxious you'll tend to have, and the easier it'll be to work on that primary anxious anxiety, which comes from, I must do a good job on the talk. And that segues well into the third difference between CBT and REBT, and that is that REBT has a concept called unconditional self-acceptance. Yeah, and we actually, we had a whole podcast on that last mm-hmm. time about self-esteem. Yep. And uh, un- and again, I haven't seen much. Once in a while, there's a mention of self-acceptance rather as an antidote to self-esteem mm-hmm. in the CBT literature, but not much at all. And unconditional self-acceptance means rather than rating yourself as a total person, I'm a good person because I did well at the talk, or I'm a loser because uh, my wife kicked me out and divorced me. Uh, The proper way to look at those things is I'm an imperfect human who acts imperfectly. I lost my wife. That's what happened, but that doesn't make me a total loser as a person uh, or my essence. Or I did a poor job at this talk, 
but this again shows I'm a fallible human who does poorly at times, but I can unconditionally accept myself no matter what as the imperfect human I am who can considerably enjoy life even with my failures and even with my rejections. Unconditional self-acceptance, USA. And USA reveals a blind spot that CBT and other therapies have. As we said, there is a problem with the whole concept of self-esteem as it requires a form of people rating, determining a person, including yourself, to be better or worse than another person. People rating is impossible, though. Uh, CBT doesn't even begin to address that problem. But REBT does in the form of unconditional self-acceptance. That's right. And as you said about people rating, the goal in order to achieve USA is to rate your behavior. Mm -hmm. That's important. So then you can maintain it if you rate it as good or improve if you rate it as poor. But don't rate your essence, your being, or your personhood. Now, on the fourth item in your article, you had a provocative heading, Helpful Negative Emotions. What do you mean by that? That's a good question. And again, CBT therapists don't tend to differentiate between helpful negative emotions or unhelpful negative emotions. They classify all emotions uh, as either negative or positive. Mm -hmm. And they talk about emotions in terms of intensity so they might say a little anxiety before a talk is good because it it gets you going but a lot of anxiety isn't because it's debilitating and with rebt i think we have a clearer way of looking at it and that is all anxiety is unhelpful or unreasonable because it never really helps you and particularly because it comes from unrealistic or irrational ideas such as must and shoulds. Let's suppose a loved one dies and you feel very intensely sad and unhappy and you mourn and grieve and cry. That would be a helpful negative emotion, even though it's very intense. Uh, but if you lose a dollar and you think, I absolutely must not lose that dollar, uh, and it's a not a strong must because it's only a dollar, then you could have an, an inappropriate negative emotion because it comes from a demand, a must or a should. So, so to decide whether a negative emotion is helpful or unhelpful, appropriate or inappropriate, don't look at how intense it is, but look at whether there's reasonable, uh, rational or irrational ideas behind it, whether there's demands behind it or not. And what I like about that is that it seems to be more goal-focused in that the definition of helpful or unhelpful, appropriate or inappropriate, is influenced by whether the demand inhibits a person's goals or not. Does that make sense here? Oh, yes, very much so, and I'm glad you added that uh, because normally if you're a little depressed, that's normally not going to help you get closer to your goals. But if you're sad or disappointed about what's going on, then that's going to be a motivator to try to do better. But normally, if you're a little depressed, that comes from thinking you're no good, you're worthless, and distracts you from focusing on how you can achieve your goal. And lastly, speaking of helpful or unhelpful, appropriate or inappropriate, we do label one emotion as always unhelpful and always inappropriate, and that's anger, the fifth and final point of your article. Okay, and this is, in a way, it's sort of builds on the previous one about uh, helpful negative emotions. All anger is an unhelpful, inappropriate negative emotion because it comes from a demand. Yeah. Uh, there are three main demands, and uh, this comes from the second one. Others must treat me kindly, courteously, under, un with understanding, lovingly appropriately and if they don't they're no good they deserve to roast in hell and i've appointed myself their roaster and uh, so that leads to anger resentment hostility and sometimes worse roar wars uh homicide mass murder things like that and uh that's never appropriate even a little bit of it and uh, the alternative is displeasure, frustration, and then appropriate assertiveness to try to uh, influence someone to change 
rather than anger. Normally, anger alienates other people, and they're less likely to want to change to make you happy Mm -hmm. uh, because they don't like that you are angry at them. And uh, so all in that case, all anger is inappropriate. And it really does turn the angry one into a judge and the center of the universe, once again engaging in a form of people rating. And what I mean by that is the angry one has the belief that since, at least in that moment, I am better than you and you are not doing what I demand you must do because you are not, I now must enact my form of a just response in the form of anger upon you. But that's not really a human function, rating and judging other people's total worth or even their own. Yes, and I agree it's not a human function, it's a human dysfunction. And as you're saying, it says, I run the universe and you should do my bidding. It's sort of setting yourself up as a tin god. Exactly. Anything else you want to add? Yes, there is one thing that I wanted to add, and that is that everything we speak about uh, uh, in REBT comes from the brilliant works of uh, the pioneering psychologist Albert Ellis. Albert Ellis wrote 80 books, over 80 books, 85 books, and uh, he was my mentor, and uh, Tommy has read a number of his books also and probably listened to... Uh, a number of his, of his YouTube lectures. So he's the master. So I suggest that you hear some of his words, his insights, which are almost always brilliant. And if not for him, we wouldn't even have CBT today. That's right. All right, folks, that's going to wrap it up for today. If you want to read this article, you're going to find a link for it below this recording. And, of course, I would encourage you to go to Michael's website, 3 therapycom You'll find a link for that below this recording as well. Also, please email us your questions to rebtadvocates at gmail.com. That's rebtadvocates at gmail.com. Again, guys, thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.